Good afternoon. It's great to see so many old friends and meet new ones, and it's particularly wonderful to see uh, so many uh, men with Duchenne here. It was a great transition meeting, and I hope uh, that becomes a, um, a tradition in future years. So um, I'm kicking off uh, what will be three sessions, two today and uh, one tomorrow on uh, specific uh, clinical trials, and you're going to get to hear from uh, the chief medical officers and other leaders uh, from various companies on their current trials and, and planned trials in Duchenne. Yep. Uh, these are uh, my uh, financial disclosures. And I have several uh, messages that I'd, I'd like to give you in a short period of time, but I think the most important thing um, that I'd like to uh, impress upon you is a, a sense of, of optimism, that it it's really is an extraordinary time. And um, I have been coming to PPMD meetings, I think, for about 12 years. And, and there's never been a conference like this with so many uh, drugs and trials and so much industry involvement. Um, and I personally feel very optimistic that um, several of these drugs are going to make it, and they're going to make a difference. So many of you have participated in clinical research, but there are some uh, people in the audience um, who are new to Duchenne and who are new to clinical research. And so I'd like to, to give just a, a little bit of, of background on, on what that means. So um, clinical research is research that involves uh, human uh, volunteers who we call uh, participants or subjects. Uh, and they're not patients, or the relationship is not one of a doctor and patient. It's a different relationship. Um, clinical research is carefully conducted investigations to ultimately uncover better ways to treat, prevent, diagnose, and understand uh, human disease. There are many types of clinical research. Is this the pointer? No. That's not it either. Uh, oh, shoot. Now I've done it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, so uh, several of you have participated, uh, for instance, in natural history studies, for instance, uh, the MRI uh, studies down in Florida, and, um, and, and natural history studies are, are to determine how does uh, disease and health uh, progress, and there are many other types of clinical research, what we're going to be concentrating on in, in the next uh, three sessions, um, however are uh, treatment trials or intervention studies to test new treatments, new combination of drugs or new approaches to therapy to see uh, whether they're safe and efficacious in the disease population. So as we're all uh, painfully aware, uh, it takes uh, many years uh, for a, a drug to be uh, developed and to be uh, FDA approved. And uh, for uh, one drug that's FDA approved, uh, thousands uh, start off in uh, preclinical uh, studies. And then um, uh, winnowing numbers uh, uh, make it through the various uh, different phases. So phase one trials are to assess the safety uh, and tolerability of a drug. And these uh, begin in healthy volunteers and then in the target population, which is Duchenne here. They have limited number of people that are involved, uh, limited number of participants. And uh, the trials look at uh, what are called pharmacokinetics also. So it says, how is the drug absorbed? What uh, rate is it absorbed at? Uh, how is it uh, broken down, metabolized? How is it ex is excreted in, in the urine, feces, et cetera? They very frequently include dose escalation to look at safety and tolerability. What's the maximum dose that, that's tolerated or minimum dose? Um, and, um, uh, and, and what are the uh, pharmacokinetics of those various different doses? And about 70% of new drugs uh, pass uh, this phase. Phase two assesses drug efficacy and further evaluates uh, safety. Uh, these trials are frequently randomized, which I'm going to discuss more controlled. Um, they, they involve surrogate outcome measures, which you've been learning about, biomarkers. Uh, they're short-term, small numbers of participants again, and about 22% of drugs which enter phase two go forward. 
phase three trials are large scale randomized controlled trials to confirm the efficacy and safety in a larger population involves hundreds of patients usually, sometimes not in in, uh, rare diseases such as Duchenne. Um, They're randomized, placebo controlled, longer term. Uh, The outcome measures would be more similar to the real world, such as function, quality of life. These trials and the information that's gathered from these trials defines uh, what's in that packaging insert and uh, what's uh, marketed. 55% of drugs that enter uh, phase three are successful. So if you uh, multiply uh, those uh, out, uh, about 8% of drugs that enter clinical trials are FDA approved. So a couple concepts that I think are important to understand about clinical trials. One of them is randomization. So your, your child or you is randomly assigned to a treatment arm, also called a cohort. So for example, uh, if we were going to assign 40 people randomly to four different treatment arms, condition one might get wonder drug at 5%, condition two at 10%, condition three at 15%, and condition four gets a placebo. Each participant gets a unique participation number and then a randomizer algorithm is, generates a set of non-unique unsorted numbers from a range from one to four, uh, and each number represents the condition. So, for instance, uh, so for instance, the first uh, subject. Uh, here gets randomized to condition three, and uh, the second and third subjects are placebo, et cetera. And so you can see that the investigator, who may be your physician or the chief medical officer who you've gotten to meet at PPMD, or your mother, has no control, no no influence over this uh, randomization. And I I think that that's important um, to uh, to understand um, as uh, there can be a lot of uh, misconceptions and hopes that that one can influence uh, this uh, process. You've heard uh, from uh, Dr. Farkas about uh, control, so I won't uh, belabor that. Uh, but there are, there are many different types of controls, and that uh, he did mention this, and there are many different types of controls currently in clinical trials for Duchenne. So we do have placebo controls. We have other treatments. Uh, for instance, in the 4-DMD trial, some kids are getting uh, deflazacort. Other kids are getting another treatment, a different, uh, t- uh, different corticosteroid um, and, and then some uh, no treatment at all. Some are being compared to uh, historical controls, what has happened to two boys uh, that we uh, um, haven't received treatment, but we've uh, generated data on. And there doesn't need to be a one-to-one ratio of uh, treatment uh, versus control, and there frequently, uh, frequently isn't. So let's say you decide to participate in a clinical trial and, and you meet uh, the dream team and but but there are a lot of different people and what what do what are each of their roles so the principal investigator um, is uh, usually a physician uh, they may have a uh, co or sub pi and they're ultimately responsible for the well-being of the patient and good data collection so this is the person for instance that you would mention what you might consider um, a side effect of the the treatment or concerns that you have about the health of, of your child. The, um, the clinical coordinator uh, may be a nurse, a doctor, or other professional. Uh, this person uh, makes the trial run more smoothly. So this is the person that, that is going to be talking to you about your schedule. When are you due in for your next uh, visit, for example? The clinical evaluator is usually a physical therapist measuring function. This is the person, for instance, that you're doing the six-minute walk test with and the nurse uh, collecting blood, uh, administering treatment. This may be the person who's actually hooking up your infusion. 
So you begin with a screening visit, and at that time, a very important aspect is the informed consent. I'm going to go over some questions that you should should be asking, but the informed consent is a, is a time in which you really should come away with a good understanding of what the purpose is of, of the study, what the potential risks and benefits are of not only the treatment, but the potential risks of the study, participating in the study itself. And then um, the team tries to determine eligibility. And this is often a time of, uh, of disappointment if you had wanted to participate in a clinical trial, and some of the clinical trials have very high uh, what we call screen failures, where we think a child is, is going to be able to participate, but, but, but doesn't. Because of, of a very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria, which may include things like age, and hopefully that would have been determined before you show up for screening, gender, of course, um, <laughs> type and stage of disease, previous, tre- previous treatment history, other medical medical conditions, other medicines. And one of things uh, specific for Duchenne usually is, is, the, uh, is the strength, um, how somebody does on a, a function test, and whether it's, it's reproducible. Um, and that, that's an issue, of course, with, with little kids, that sometimes there's too much um, variability, for instance, in the six-minute walk test from, from uh, day to day. Uh, talking about six-minute uh, walk tests, um, that, that is a, an outcome measure, as, as you know. These measures are um, uh, hopefully meaningful to patients every day's life. For instance, longevity would be a, a perfect outcome uh, measure, but, but is, is not very practical for clinical trials. So we, we frequently use things such as function, motor function, um, and try to uh, c- correlate uh, those with uh, uh, very uh, things that are meaningful to, into the day-to-day life. So you've participated in the clinical trial. What uh, do you expect afterwards, and what happens? Um, there's a, a huge wealth of information uh, which, which is, is studied, and that takes uh, quite a bit of time. Um, a decision is made whether to go forward uh, with the next phase, and that's, that's made uh, by uh, the, the person who owns the drug. Uh, it's, not, it's not made uh, by the, the PI, and, and it, unfortunately, it's, it's not made uh, by the patient uh, community. The results are often published in a peer-reviewed uh, journal. They may or may not be shared with the participant, and that's off also a, a source of, of misunderstanding and, and sometimes disappointment. Sometimes the, the, uh, the data is really not in a, uh, a format that is uh, easily clinically available or easily clinically shared, and there may be other reasons why the company uh, doesn't want to disseminate that information. Uh, and whether there's continued access to the drug depends in large part on the success of the trial. If this is a, a small phase two trial and it doesn't look as if the drug is either safe or potentially effective, it's not going on to a phase three. And if it's not going on to a phase three, there is no access to the drug. The drug is not getting made. So why would one want to participate? Really the reason one should participate is to play an active role in research and to improve the treatment of the disease. What what has been shown across diseases is that those who participate uh, receive regular and careful medical attention, a lot more medical attention than they would otherwise receive, and there are benefits to that. I know why uh, patients with Duchenne participate, um, it may be some of the first two, but it's in large part to gain access to new treatments before they're wildly available. But this, as I'm trying to emphasize, may or may not occur. Um, I like this uh, quote from one of my adult uh, patients who participated in a trial, and he was very disappointed that uh, there was not continued access uh, to this drug, which he felt was helping him. But still, he had a lot of positive uh, feelings about participating in the trial, and I'll read it to you. It says, to my surprise and appreciation, I found myself immersed in a medical system that overflowed with passion for its work. I was surrounded by doctors, surgeons, nurses, and aides who were attentive and engaged. I found myself looking forward to each visit and the exchange of information and knowledge. 
Now, that's an adult patient, and a, and a kid, kid may not feel that way. Um, there may not be that much exchange. Um, and I think the, the burden of participating in a clinical trial is very different for a child than an adult. But, um, but, there, but there are some general positivities of participation in addition to uh, potential early access. So questions that you want to ask at the beginning of the trial and during the consent process is a good time. It's, of course, who is sponsoring the trial? What is the participant burden? What are the risks, not only of the treatment, but of the studies? What's the degree of harm that could occur? And but what's also the chance of harm? So something might, there may be a very, very low percent of some, something with a very high degree or, or vice versa. What will be billed to the study versus the patient? What's the ratio of placebo to treatment? And is there a commitment to an extension study? So you've seen uh, this slide a couple times already at this conference um, showing uh, the the multiple different ways that uh, uh, companies and uh, academia are attempting to impact the uh, various aspects uh, that cause uh, Duchenne. And uh, these slides will be available um, on uh, the uh, website so that you don't uh, need to uh, take this all in now. But these are the uh, drugs uh, that I'm aware of that are currently in um, clinical trials for Duchenne. And this shows uh, the, their, the various phases. And again, you know, this is just extremely exciting. There's never been this many drugs and this many promising drugs. I'd also like to have a, a particular uh, call out um, uh, f- for, the, for the 4 DMD trial for any uh, p- parents who are here whose children haven't started on corticosteroids. I think this is a this is a non sexy trial, and you know the investigators know that. But this is a really important trial to look at the difference of deflazacort versus two different regimens of prednisone because we all think we that we know what's what's the best w- corticosteroid and what's the best regimen, but there's really quite a bit of ambiguity. These are some of the drugs that are up and coming. There are many very exciting drugs here also, um, and um, all of these are anticipated to enter uh, within the next year or two. So I've told you that only one in 5,000 compounds or so that enter preclinical testing proceed to human trials, and about one in 12 drugs entering clinical trials is approved. Um, how do we improve those odds? The costs are, are uh, overwhelming, and this really may not be uh, sustainable in the long term. Maybe it's not already. One uh, approach has been by TREAT and MD, um, and this is the Treat NMD Advisory Committee for Therapeutics, which was established a number of years ago, uh, for, which is a, a multinational effort with volunteers from academia, industry, nonprofit, regulatory bodies, and patient advocacy, including PPMD, which is a major player in TACT. Um, it provides development advice to academia and industry. It's multidisciplinary with comprehensive input. It's independent of any funding stream, meaning that TACT doesn't actually fund uh, proposals or developments. It gives advice. So as, as John was saying, that you know, drugs shouldn't fail for stupid reasons. That's, that's the, the purpose of TACT. Uh, patient foundations such as PPMD and, and, and Cure uh, DMD partner with TACT, uh, integrate TACT review uh, in its diligence for funding. So TACT is attempting to address a fragmented, subjective approach, attempting to address the the variability of rigor of assessments across uh, funders and researchers. Compounds moving into the clinic despite non-compelling clinical data leading to predictable failure in the clinic. Often um, companies lack realistic development perspective multiple compounds going into the clinic, but we have limited number of patients, and really no patient should be in a clinical trial that doesn't have a good potential for success. 
So uh, TACTUS had 11 meetings, reviewed uh, 32 programs from industry and academia. Some are novel drugs, some are being repurposed for Duchenne. Um, three have received orphan drug designation from uh, the EMA and three from the FDA. So I'll end. The, the points that I've uh, tried to make uh, that are that there are a number of drugs in trials for Duchenne. This is really unprecedented and, and real reason for optimism. Participation in clinical trials has both positives and negatives, and it's not the same as early access to a treatment. Uh, facilitating drug development is a primary mission of TACT and of PPD, P, PMD. How could I miss that up? So um, this is where I do clinical trials, uh, the Center for Genetic Muscle Disorders of Kennedy Krieger Institute uh, with uh, my collaborators both in clinical and research. Angie, Melanie, Nakia, uh, Kylie, and Carla are all here to, uh, at this meeting, and I hope you have an opportunity to uh, meet them. And uh, you cannot see my uh, email address there, but that is my uh, telephone number, and these slides will be available. So if there are questions or things that weren't clear, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you.